full. Here's some of those marble tombstones. And you see what I mean about the way that they weather? Right? Some of these have weathered so badly you can barely read the names. Okay? So looking again at the symbolism, what can you say about Mary? She's a baby, right? She's a small child. Even without reading an inscription, that the lamb is a symbol of that. Now this one is an interesting symbol, right? This is typically when one member of a husband and wife pair dies. And so you have the two hands holding each other. If you look carefully, usually one hand is dead and the hand is just flat. And the other spouse is still alive and so their hand actually grasps and wraps around to hold the hand of the deceased. On some of these where the carvers are really good, you can actually tell who died by looking at the hand and then looking at the cuff. It's a very lacy woman's cuff or whether it's more like a suit jacket and dress shirt kind of cuff. Um, before I walked around, I wasn't honest, didn't pay enough attention. Can you tell which one's dead and which one's alive? On a few of these, there's an endearing mystery because on a few of them, one finger will stick out. Why does it have one finger sticking out like that? No one's ever come up with a convincing argument. Everybody's got a hypothesis or a theory. All the ones I've read sound like crap. It sound, doesn't sound plausible to me. Okay. We talked about vandalism. These marble tombstones, because of the way they are constructed, are really susceptible to vandalism. They're easy to, easily broken. And unfortunately, there's not a good way to repair them. Sometimes you'll see people try to do that with cement. That's a bad idea. Cement is usually acidic. And the acid from the cement just makes the de deterioration of the, of the marble accelerate. Sometimes you'll see people do that with like epoxy or, or uh, industrial glues. Again, not good for the, for the marble. So there really isn't a great way to fix these when they are broken. One of the worst things you can do, however, is to lay them flat. When they lay flat, all the carving collects water. And it's that water that's causing the marble to deteriorate. So as they lay flat, the inscriptions, the design, the symbols erode that much more quickly. So laying flat is worse than standing up. Now, I said there'd be a few in here that were very old. The marble in this area dates from between, say, 1840 and 1890. But this tombstone So these are very common. The problem with shale is it's very porous. And so water gets down in the shale, and then in the wintertime it freezes. And so when that water freezes, the front of the stone falls off. And so if you notice, you can tell that there was an Elizabeth, and you can't really tell anything else about here. I know there are two people represented by the stone because it's a double stone. All right? These are the earliest ones. This would date to about 1840 and would have been moved from that early first cemetery. In St. Clair, there's a cemetery along the Pine River that has hundreds of these, some of which are still in reasonable shape, some of which are as bad as this one. Okay. Uh, let's see. Let's, let's head over this way. Does anybody see the symbol on this stone here? It's on a ribbon with an eagle at the top and a star with the point down. I've never noticed this particular stone before. I'm going to have to go back and do some research. That looks remarkably similar to me to a Congressional Medal of Honor. And if it is, I wasn't aware that we had anyone in the cemetery that had been awarded one. Right? I'm, I'm, I think I'm, I must be wrong 
because if this really were a Congressional Medal of Honor winner, we would know it, and there'd be flags, and there'd be more hoopla surrounding it. Since it's not, it must mean something else, but I'll have to do some research and figure out what that one means. I've never noticed it before. Some of the stones in the cemetery are instantly recognizable. This is for a Civil War veteran. This is one. Of, this is the more typical Civil War veteran tombstone. These were provided by the forerunner to the Veterans Administration. Okay, so if you fought in the Civil War, you'd get a stone like this. The the shield shape sets us apart from later wars. Later wars don't use that shield shape around it, so I could tell instantly from a distance. As it turns out, they're in the 22nd Michigan Infantry, part of which was recruited here. In fact, Colonel Sanborn, the colonel of the regiment, is buried in here somewhere. I've run across him before. Okay. Over here, in many cemeteries, you'll have these old tall obelisk monuments, like that one, or this one. What happens with them over time is that the base will settle and crack. And sometimes they start to lean. And so many cemeteries essentially take the top piece off of these. So that if it were to ever fall, that it would be no danger of falling on anyone. Right? That potentially, I guess, if this were leaning, that, that you, you would be unhappy if that fell on you. Okay. So this is kind of a typical monument from about 1860 or the mid-1850s. Um, around on this side, they have some symbolism carved in it. In the past, we were really big on symbolism. And so many of the graves would have symbols representing something. Here on the right, there's a pillar that's broken, right? Again, kind of the same thing as a life cut short, with some angels to carry the deceased up to heaven. Over here is the, this represents the Bible, right? These are supposed to be roses. Okay? And down here, the anchor and the shield, the anchor and the shield of my faith. Right, Lord, shield me and anchor me in the faith. Right? Sometimes people think that this means he was a soldier and a sailor or something, but no, it's, those are traditional Christian symbols. A sword is another traditional Christian symbol. This is a family marker. The individual people are represented by these footstones. They do have initials on the stone to try to, so you might be able to tie it back to the names here. Uh, but a lot of them are really badly worn, so it's hard to tell. I've never taken the time. Over here is an interesting piece. Fort Gratiot was down by the bridge. The fort was in existence for 60 years off and on, and so People died while they were stationed at Fort Gratiot. Fort had its own cemetery. Long before Fort Huron had its own cemetery. That cemetery is in Pine Grove Park, if you know where Pine Grove Park is, roughly where the boulder, the Thomas Edison boulder is. When they built this cemetery, they decided they were going to take all the former military property and subdivide it and sell it. And so they needed to get the bodies out of the cemetery. And so these are graves from the Fort Gratiot Cemetery. We won't go all the way through it, but if you take my word for it, more than half of them just say unknown because they were originally marked with a wooden headboard. And over the years between, say, 1820 or 1830 and 1870, when they were removed, the headboards had gotten too weather to read or had been destroyed or vandalized. So most of these are unknown. I suspect if we went into this, the park with a shovel, we might find bodies that were not graves that weren't obvious in 1870 when they were removed. And so there's probably some people who got left behind that are still in the park. This is an interesting one. Josh, Josiah Everett was the surgeon. There, uh, there was a, a Black Hawk War, an Indian a conflict with some Native Americans over in Indiana and Illinois. And so some troops were being redeployed because they were afraid that it might spread. And so some recruits were being taken up from Detroit up to 
and they were going to eventually be shipped around to Chicago. But as, <coughs> as they were on the ship, they had yellow fever, which is like malaria but more deadly. They spread by mosquitoes. And so the ships, when they got to Port, one of them turned back, and the one that got to Port Huron, there was too many people sick, they got off the ship, they refused to allow them to go all the way up, up the lakes with these sick people. So they all got off at the port. The surgeon got off with them and tended them, right? About a quarter of the people in here died in that, died from that. They were those raw recruits, never even actually really started their service. And this was the surgeon that tried to save their lives. Uh, his stone is early. He died in 1832, and I can tell by the shape of it. That stone was actually created in about 1832. And from the stylistic, the way it's shaped, the details of the carving, that's made in Philadelphia. Okay? So it's made in Philadelphia in about 1832. I don't, I've never researched Josiah Everett, but I bet that's where his family was. And I bet they had this made and shipped out here to be put over his grave. So this, this would have stood in that fort cemetery. This is the right period. All the other tombstones in here were added when the graves were moved. Whatever tombstones those people might have had, they were replaced by these. But they kept this one. Right? Again, the urn motif, and then the weeping willow symbolizing mourning. Okay. We're going to head that way.